So a good morning to you all once again, and thank you for joining this webinar. It's on garlic farming business. So my name is Rollings, and I am with Agribusiness Media. It's a company with uh, the largest farmer audience in the country, under which you find the popular free monthly agribusiness magazine, the annual free agribusiness directory, which is meant to link uh, farmers with agri in, agro input and service uh, dealers, and as well as uh, parastatals and government ministries. Then we this agribusiness directory, uh, whose forward was done by Dr. Basera, it's also free for farmers, and we'll post a link in the chat where you can download the director for free. It has got uh, many great functions and it's very interactive. Where say you are looking for a certain uh, uh, contacts for a certain organization, you just type in the name of that organization and automatically uh, the results will show up and you'll be able to contact them via email uh, from just a click on the page. So we also have the agribusiness talk which is our digital platforms where we post free information for you farmers so we are on uh, facebook on twitter we also have over 540 whatsapp groups and later on we will share a link to our latest group and you just click that link and follow the instructions and you will join our whatsapp groups uh, one of our WhatsApp groups where you will get to meet experts from the agricultural industry. In the WhatsApp groups, you can also ask questions and also share your experiences. So you can also uh, motivate other farmers as well. And where you have challenges, you can also post then we look uh, at the challenges together and see how best we can help you. So we also have this agribusiness online television, which is hosting this webinar uh, or these weekly webinars. And we'll also share links to our YouTube channel later on. And please be sure to subscribe to receive more of uh, this content. So if you are looking for information on the business of uh, garlic production, you are in the right place. So welcome to the business of garlic production webinar. So we are live on our agribusiness media Facebook page. And reason why we are doing this webinar is to give specialists from different organizations to share their experience, their business, their technical information, and also management practices that we believe will help in the migration from subsistence to commercial farming. So this webinar is made possible by agribusiness online television. So as I said, I will share a link to the agribusiness media page or YouTube channel as well in the chat section. So today, they say today, garlic is one of the 20 most important vegetables uh, in the world. That's, that's very interesting. So how this webinar is going to unfold, is we will have informative discussions with great presentations from the experts in the industry. And thereafter, we will have a question and answer uh, section. So we'll give farmers and also participants that are joining us a chance to ask questions. And this we have built in the program. So to allow for a smooth transition between the presenters, we have a question and answer section after all the presenters. So if you have any question, please just type in the chat section with excellent uh, experts to, to attend to your questions. So without wasting time, uh, let me invite our presenters to introduce themselves. We'll start with uh, D. Monutu from ZFC, then Mr. Karimba is with Garlic, Ginger and Turmeric Growers Association. K. Mizi Zimtrade, Mr. Makotore is with Agribusiness and Markets Division, Minister of Agriculture. So may I invite the presenters to introduce themselves in that order, please. Thank you. 
Good morning to you farmers. Uh, my name is Didai Caleb Munutu. I'm an agronomist with ZFC Limited. Uh, we shall be sharing on tips on nutrition as well as, crop nutri as well as crop protection aspects. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, uh, Zizai. Then next we have Mr. Karimba, he's with the Garlic Association. Maybe he's not on the call yet. We also have uh, K Midzi. Uh, Kupakwashe Midzi is with uh, Zim Trade. Kupakwashe, are you on the call yet? Uh, yes, morning everyone. Uh, my name is Kupakwashe Mizi. I'm in the export development department with ZimTrade. And I'm going to be sharing a little bit more on potential export markets for garlic. Thanks, Kupakwashe. Then we also have Mr. Makotore. He's with the Agribusiness and Markets Division under the Ministry of Agriculture. Mr. Makotore, are you on the call yet? Okay, seems he's, um, he hasn't joined it yet. Okay, so without wasting time, we'll start off with uh, a presentation from ZFC. ZFC will cover soil health and crop health aspects. So you can go for it, uh, Zizai Monotu. Okay, uh, thank you, Rollins. Uh, would you enable me to, to share? Sure, um, just hold on. You should be able to share now. All right, let me try. Yes, we can see your screen now. Right. That, that's good. So, uh, as I have just uh, highlighted, my name is Aziz Aikelep Manutu. Um, we shall be sharing uh, tips on how to best get, uh, on how to get the best quality of garlic out of uh, the fields that we till. So, to start off, right, uh, I'm back now, Rollins. Ah, okay, great, thank you. Okay. So basically, garlic is a uh, scientific, we call it IAM sativa. It is one of those perennial crops in their growth habit, habit. But now, uh, commercially, we it is grown as an annual. So this is just because we just, we farmers need to cut on the time of production so that we get a, a good returns within a reasonable time frame. We should be able to sell, um, within a short space of time, which is why it is grown as a commercial crop. So garlic has got several benefits, uh, amongst which uh, health benefits, you realize that garlic has been used as an, an, as an antiseptic since time immemorial, and up to now, it is still being used as an antiseptic and for sorry, to interrupt. sorry to interrupt, uh, Zizai. Are you able uh -huh. to go on a, a full screen presentation mode? Okay, I'm not too sure what's happening with my laptop. Let me try once again, but ah. uh, it, it wasn't moving when I when I attempted la the, the last time. Oh, I see. Okay, right. I think it's now working, is it? Yes, now working. Thank you. Okay, so globally. Uh, garlic is one of the crops that is on demand. Uh, this means that for the small scale farmer, the commercial farmer, we have uh, great opportunities that are with us. Uh, apart from the local, the, the, the local market, uh, in terms of exports, I'm sure I'm sure we'll get more information from Zimtrade concerning uh, the export market for garlic. So it is critical that farmers we con seriously consider this one. So this is just basically to, to, to show uh, a picture of uh, the general structure of, of garlic, where you have your, your, your clove, your, your bulbs and your cloves. Uh, bulbs are made out of, uh, out of cloves. 
uh, is, is depicted by that picture. Uh, you have several cloves to make one, uh, one, one bulb. That is where your money is, and that is the part where we are most, uh, where we are most concerned. When you have uh, your, your good bulbs forming, it means you have good money that will be coming out. So generally, this is what you expect out of a field when you take it to the market. So uh, to start off with garlic production requirements, uh, garlic generally uh, is related to, close related to onions. And the, 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 the bulbs generally mature in four to five or sometimes six months. And the, we have got different uh, flesh types or different varieties that some have got white flesh, some that are purplish as well. So you will realize that from each bulb, you can have as much as five to 16 cloves, uh, to 16 cloves depending on, on the variety which you would have grown. So in terms of the climatic requirements, uh, garlic generally thrives well in an environment where the temperature is 12 to 25 degrees Celsius generally, uh, but of course, when you have a, you tend to have a better, a better yield when you have a temperature, a, a more prolonged temperature of about 20 degrees Celsius. Uh, this is because for bulbs to form, they require low temperatures, just as the same concept that we apply in onions. Anything that is above 30 degrees Celsius then uh, tends not to be good for bulb formation, which is why we should plant our uh, the, the, the garlic cloves towards uh, the winter period, say from February, March, April, going onwards, depending on the uh, on the size that you intend to size of bulb that you intend to get, and also depending on the on your market requirements, that will be part of the critical or critical decision making tools that you would have. So time of planting is critical. Uh, it is important to note, to note that garlic does not uh, grow well in areas where we have got excessive rainfall. Therefore, you realize garlic requires well-drained uh, soils, particularly the sands in the looms. You, in heavy clays, you realize that uh, sometimes uh, it will be difficult for, for, for the bulbs to, to really expand within that soil, both clay soils tend to, to shrink much. So it's best to, to, uh, to grow garlic in a friable soil that is well drained to allow water to pass down so that you don't end up having your bulbs and the roots uh, rotting. Generally, uh, when you use uh, organic matter or when you use uh, uh, compost out in, your, in your crop, you realize that the, you tend to have thick necks. Thick necks have got a challenge to do uh, with uh, drying. When drying time comes, when you've got a very thick neck, a very thick neck because of uh, high levels of nitrogen, you then tend to have challenges in having your bulbs uh, drying well. Therefore, we simply recommend that you stick to, to the stipulated fertilizer program that we are we are going to share or you can have the compost and manure analyzed so that you don't have uh, excessive applications of your nitrogen which will then be problematic in the keeping quality of your of your garlic um, generally garlic requires a soil pH within uh, a range of 5.5 to 6.5 which is the critical based on the calcium chloride scale. When you have your, 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 your pH within this range, then you know you're also going to get some good yields if you do put in your fertilizer requirements uh, as nice. So garlic generally it's a heavy feeder. It requires uh, more of the potash and more of the phosphate, particularly uh, at establishment and uh, development. So for you to be able to get uh, these these uh, requirements, the phosphorus and the potash, you need to get them from a good uh, fertilizer program, such as the one you get from ZFC Limited. So how then do you know what amount of 
potash, what amount of nitrogen in the end of uh, potassium to apply. You get to know these when you, uh, when you get your cells analyzed. So this is what you do as RFC Limited. You bring in your cells for analysis. We check on the NPK requirements as well as the trace elements requirements so that we then try to calculate the fertilizer requirements to match the tonnage or to match the yield that you anticipate to get out of, uh, out of your field. So soil analysis is key. This is a must for every farmer if you are to get some good yields. So, so basically, in terms of uh, your fertilizer requirements, you your basal dressing. You require you require uh, what we do as LFC, we, we we have got two different kinds of uh, basal fertilizers. We have compounds and we also have blends. So with uh, compounds, we, we have got a product called uh, ZFC Tobacco Blend. So on the previous slide, uh, Rollins. Right, uh, the formulation is generally 5, 15, 12. So you, you tend to get, you tend to require about 800 to 1,000 kgs uh, per hectare. That is 800 kgs to a ton uh, per hectare, depending on your soil analysis results. Uh, also get to use your vegetable blend. In formulation, it is 9, 24, 20. Uh, there are also other blends that you can use, like your tobacco blend. Uh, there are two formulations, the 6, 24, 20 and the 6, 28, 23. Where about you require uh, an application of uh, 600 to 800 kgs uh, per hectare. So this is what you require during land preparation. You, you, you make your beds, you incorporate these fertilizers into the soil, and then uh, come up with your planting stations. Then the close, remember your garlic is quite closely spaced as you be planting. In row spacing should be five to eight centimeters uh, within each row, and uh, your interval spacing generally would be uh, from 30 to 40 centimeters. So you, the crop will be able to extract all the nutrients that you've applied as basal. Then looking on the top dressing aspect, you require ammonium nitrate, very little of it, uh, that is about 100 kgs to 150 kgs per hectare of your nitrogen which is applied in week, uh, between week three and week five after planting, after the crop has emerged. But you also realize that after so having analyzed your soil, sometimes we do have farmers that have got uh, low, um, uh, low potash levels. This then requires us to apply a, an application of MOP, which simply means a um, muriate of potash uh, at a rate of about 100 to, 100 to 200 kgs uh, per hectare. That is if it is necessary. And we can only get to know if it is necessary after having analyzed our soils. Next slide, please. So ZFC has got a range of specialty fertilizers. It, to start off, we, we've got a, a fertilizer that we call Quick Start. This is, this is high in, uh, in phosphorus, as you can see. 46% uh, of your phosphorus. It, this helps to quickly establish the crop as the roots develop so that it will then be, the crop will then be able to fully utilize or fully extract nutrients from the ground. This is why you require uh, one special, one such specialty fertilizer uh, is quick start. Then you go on to your quick grow, uh, 2010, 20, that is your NPK. It's high in your nitrogen, uh, as well as uh, now the, 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 the uh, phosphorus uh, percentage is lower. And then you have your K requirement because during this phase, now you are preparing uh, for bulb formation and you'd want to supply as much K as possible so that you have uh, the cloth swimming well. Uh, take note that uh, quick start and quick grow have got some trace elements in them. Uh, Yes, it trace, it trace elements and secondary elements, your calcium, magnesium, uh, zinc, sulfur, copper, iron. These are critical in improving the quality of your crop. 
Therefore, there are really uh, some products to consider in a fertilization program. Then you tend to have uh, your, your monopotassium phosphate, your sulfate of potash, and your MOP. These are then, uh, these can then be applied using different methods. You can do side placement, you can do drenching, you can also do um, foliar sprays or even applying through the fertigation or, or through the irrigation system, uh, a method that we call fertigation. So because this is made possible because these are specialty fertilizers, they're highly soluble and really available for plant uptake. So generally, in terms of your planting material, uh, farmers should really consider uh, good quality cloves or good quality bulbs to, to as planting material. You can then start off by grading them in terms of size, in terms of the, the coloring in terms of uh, uh, the texture. You need to disregard uh, diseased material, material that is soft and material that is damaged. It will not be good for you to, in terms of establishing a crop. Uh, when you plant in you larger cloves, you also tend to get a, a, a bigger yields, probably because they have got bigger reserves of energy Though you'll be applying, you'll be applying some more energy through the fertilizer uh, programs. So uh, generally, it is recommended to plant garlic in your April, from April, uh, where it is then subjected to the lower temperatures, which I which I mentioned earlier. But it is important uh, to take note that it is not only in April that you can plant your garlic. I, I, I said before that. Some farmers do plant in their garlic earlier, depending on their target market, and also depending on the size which they wish to attain. Because some do get uh, the garlic for, for, for processing. So now I move on to the crop uh, protection aspects, where we are looking at uh, with the insect pests, we are looking at diseases, and we are also looking at uh, weed control aspects. So the major pests that we have got uh, in garlic uh, are thrips. Uh, basically, it, it varies, it, there are various growth stages. They do damage uh, the leaves in terms of sucking uh, the sap out of the, 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 the garlic leaves. So you realize that when, when the population for, for these thrips uh, is, is pretty much on the high side, uh, the plants then get, tend to, to wilt and eventually die. It is important to note that thrips migrate from one field to the other, like just like in other uh, surviving pests, uh, it requires uh, a more conducive environment to grow, uh, to grow or to feed on. It also requires um, a, a, a host that is more favorable. Therefore, uh, it is important for farmers to keep areas weed free. It is critical that we keep uh, uh, the surrounding, the areas of, around the field. Because I, I have realized that with most farmers, they just want to, to, to keep uh, inside the fields clean and forgetting or neglecting uh, the, the perimeter or the periphery of the field. It is important that we also keep that, um, that area weed, weed free because it tends to harbor uh, your pests and sometimes your diseases. So in terms of control, you can get your malathion 25 portable powder uh, from ZFC. You can get your thunder. You can also use your spike extra uh, from, uh, from, from, from uh, the uh, different ZFC outlets. These are important to take note of. Probably I should then uh, move on to show you how uh, these, these, uh, these uh, trips appear on your garlic crop. So that is the picture uh, of an adult uh, adult trip on, uh, on a garlic leaf. It is a, a magnified uh, picture. So they tend to be clustered around, uh, around uh, on, on the leaves, particularly when you when you check on the on the leaf uh, on the V side of your of your garlic leaves, 
they tend to be clustered around this area where they will be sucking out the sap that you be that the crop would be manufacturing. So it is important to take note that we control uh, the trips as they are a serious pest that can make the farmer uh, get some serious losses out of their fields. Then you all, you, you also have three, uh, sometimes aphids that then get to to interfere with the growth of your garlic crop, but they are not very much of a of a serious issue because with those chemicals that I've just highlighted, your your, your spike extra, uh, your malathion, as well as your thunder, do do take care of of the aphids. Then we move on to the diseases. We have got down in you, uh, which is one of our. Uh, uh, the fungal diseases that that's quite a problem in uh, in garlic production. Um, we recommend that you you spray products like the uh, Dithin M45, which is your mancozep. You also need to apply your diphenoconazole and your flower power, which is a combination of sulfur and mancozep. Uh, you can it is always advisable to spray fungicide in rotation so that you tend to have uh, different actives or different modes of action covering your, 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 your crops. And you also have the different fungal spores uh, being controlled by these fungicides. So you realize that uh, down in you, it spreads easily, uh, in, particularly in humid environments. So it is important for farmers to regularly uh, check their fields to ensure that you come in with your control measures uh, before before much damage takes place. Then we also have a uh, rust that tends to affect your 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 garlic. This is also promoted by by, by high humidity as well as some cool you know cool conditions. So symptoms uh, include white well, some small white spots that will then eventually tend to to yellowish color and probably orangish color. Um, leaves may become so heavily infected that they appear almost orange in their color. So I'll also share a picture with you so that you get to appreciate what you mean by, 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 by the rust that affects uh, your garlic crop. You, in order to control this, you need to come in with your, your fungicides such as your death in M45, your copoxychloride as protein uh, preventive sprays. And uh, sometimes to come in as curative, you need to bring in your uh, diphenoconazole as well as your tebuconazole. Um, like I highlighted earlier before, we do not want to apply high levels of nitrogen because uh, they will also uh, tend to, 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 to bring in, um, it makes the crops susceptible to, to rust. Therefore, we require uh, high potash levels so that you've got uh, a good defense against uh, infection uh, as it were, because crop nutrition, crop nutrition does play a critical role in terms of uh, providing the, the plant with the ability to resist uh, disease establishment. So that's just basically uh, a picture to show how how uh, the yellowing starts off yellowing and the orange color orange, orange color that develops uh, with once you once the rust comes in. We also have uh, another another disease that can, that usually kicks in uh, when you do your when you do your your garlic crops. It's called paper blotch which is usually caused by uh, what you call autonomia or uh, the margin or the leaf has shades of paper that develop, uh, which are usually surrounded by a, a yellow band. So once you have this, you need to make use of your mancozeb, you need to make use of your tebuconazo to control them. But we also have another one called the fusarium, which usually causes the bulb to rot. This is a soil borne disease and uh, you realize that disease progression, uh, it starts from the tip, from the tip of, uh, of, of the leaves. So usually when you have uh, 
the disease at advanced stages, uh, roots and the bulbs will show some semi, some semi water rotting, which then means you, you have little or less of your garlic bulbs uh, that would be marketable. So it is important to take note of this. Uh, that is just to show a, how, how the fusarium affects uh, your garlic crop. You also have uh, the yellowing, as I had highlighted, uh, that starts off from the tips progressing to the stem and eventually to, to, to the bulbs. So in terms of uh, how best to use this, obviously one would, need, would then need to do some fumigation over the affected land, but it is also important, like I highlighted earlier, to plant uh, a disease-free planting material, to practice crop rotation, as well as uh, to burn field residues so that we minimize uh, overwintering of, uh, of uh, your pests and diseases uh, on the same field. So when you do your crop rotations, you, you, you rotate crops of different families, you put in uh, your alliums, you put in your solar nations, you go on to the cereals, you go on to the legumes, uh, ETC, depending on your on how you plan your, your crop rotations and how you then target your, 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 your customers and your market. So these are a must, which is why I highlighted to these, uh, these are best practices for any crop. Farmers should be able to make sure they bear in mind these three practices. So in terms of uh, weed control, it is important uh, to make sure that we have got uh, a good quality crop out of a weed-free field. So, uh, farmers can use a product like Dequat, like glyphosate and Roundup to clear their fields before they, um, they plant in their garlic cloves. Take note that, uh, take, please take note that uh, we, you, 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 the Dequat, glyphosate and Roundup do not do not have any soil activity. Therefore, can safely be applied, and then later on, uh, you can plant in your your garlic cloves. Dequat is is contact and non-selective. Then glyphosate and Roundup, they are systemic and non-selective, which means to say your glyphosate and Roundup tend to have longer periods uh, of uh, for you to be able to see the efficacy of these uh, products. That means say up to within a week to two weeks, that's when you'll be able to see the result that this, the, 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 the weeds are now being scorched. But with uh, your, 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 your day cut, within uh, 24 to 72 hours, you then be seeing uh, good results and your weeds being effectively controlled. Once you have planted in your your garlic, you can uh, apply go a, a, a herbicide that is go that is called go. The active ingredient is oxyflofen. Oxyflofen. It is registered for use in your in, in your in your garlic and in your onions to control your annual and perennial grasses as well as your 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 broad leaf weeds. You need to apply this herbicide uh, as soon as possible after planting and before weeds have emerged so that you have an a, a optimal control over over your over control optimum control over weeds you don't want weeds to emerge therefore they have got to be uh, managed uh, in the rightful time when your crop is established it is growing well you may realize that you then have some stubborn grasses that tend to come out in that regard you can uh, apply a product such as fluoros for P butyl to take control of uh, the imaged uh, grass weeds. Therefore, it is important for every farmer to take note of uh, the application on on the label of each product, be it the non-selective, be it the selective herbicides. It is important for you to take note of the instructions there, so that you do apply the rightful fertilizer quantities and the, you get to apply, uh, uh, so not the fertilizer quantities, I mean 
the right chemical quantities as per the clay content, uh, as per the requirements in terms of compatibility, in terms of everything. That is all the information that we that you obtain from a label. It is important for farmers to take note to read and understand it before doing their conducting the spraying operations. This is selective. You can spray it over the top, and it will not damage your your garlic. Well. I just decided just to put in a few, uh, just two slides to on, on harvesting and uh, post harvesting operations. So you need to decide on the right time to 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 harvest your garlic so that you get enough drying time uh, so that you have uh, uh, you can then be able to store your garlic at the at good moisture content, the moisture content that will not uh, make your your garlic to rot. So basically, like I highlighted before, you can you plant your garlic in your field. You have it in your in the field for four to five months, sometimes six months, uh, depending on what method you'll be using to dry. Some use the some use some drying structures. Uh, some leave it to dry in the field. So this is entirely dependent on the farmer's choice, and also depending on uh, the resources to on the resources being used to harvest uh, the garlic. So just generally, generally, the outer skin should be firm uh, for those garlic bulbs that would have fully, fully formed. Uh, if you harvest, if the, if the, the garlic um, becomes too mature before harvest, the cloves will begin to crack and they tend to separate in the field. So it is best to harvest at a time when it is convenient enough for you to pull out the garlic and the cloves are still intact. Uh, before they begin to to crack apart. Uh, generally, harvesting requires hand pulling. The, okay, so this is just generally what, what, what's required uh, of us for to get a good quality uh, garlic crop. Uh, I think this marks the end of my my presentation, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much for that great presentation. So if you have any questions for ZFC, please post in the chat group. These I will hang around for, for the question and answer uh, quest uh, session later on. Thank you uh, once again, Zizai. Then our next presenter is Mr. N. Karimba, is with the Garlic and the Ginger Association uh, of Zimbabwe. Uh, you can go for it, Mr. Karimba. Okay, seems uh, he's not on the on the call yet. We'll try and raise him. So we may have to go to our next presenter. Is um, from ZimTrade. Is Kupakwasha Mizi. You'll you'll touch on the export market opportunities. You can go for it, uh, Mr. Mizi. All right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, morning again, everyone. Um, as I mentioned in my introduction, I will be speaking uh, on export market opportunities for garlic. Um, Rollins, I, I, I can't share my screen. Um, can you please help with that? Sure, please hold on. Uh, let me sort it out. So um, maybe while that's uh, being uh, sorted, um, I'll, I'll just, okay, let me try. Okay, perfect. Um, can everyone see, can you see my presentation now? Sure, we can see it now. Okay. So, um, like I said, like I mentioned in my introduction, I'm going to be sharing a bit uh, on uh, export market opportunities for, for garlic. And um, just as, as a way of introduction, um, I thought it prudent uh, for the sake of those that might not be aware of uh, what ZimTrade is, who we are, what we do, and how we can assist uh, farmers in their endeavor to export. So uh, ZimTrade, we are basically the National Trade Development and Promotion Organization, and uh, we were formed in 1991. And basically, our mandate is to energize Zimbabwe's export growth. 
Um, yes, we focus on trade, but uh, I think we can all understand that uh, most of our attention then is diverted towards, uh, not towards imports, but rather on, on, on exports um, so that we, we try and, um, and, 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 and become a, next, a net exporter rather than an importer, which is the current case. Uh, so in terms of our values, um, those are our four main values. Uh, uh, we are focused, bold, connected, and uh, we also seek to be trusted by our clients. And um, how we deliver in, in our mandate to energize Zimbabwe's export growth, uh, basically our service portfolio is divided into four main areas. Uh, first of which is market intelligence. Um, I think which is going to form uh, broadly um, what my presentation is going to be on today. Um, we do market research, uh, both disk research, and uh, in some instances, we actually do in-field uh, research in some of the markets. Um, basically to try and understand uh, what the market demands, what the market requires. Uh, we call the market surveys to under, better understand the market for the benefit of our clients. Um, so we've done market surveys in the region. We've done market surveys in Malawi, in uh, Botswana, in Zambia, in South Africa, um, you know, um, mostly countries in, 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 um, in Africa. Uh, then we also do um, market pointers, basically, again, research um, on a specific product into a specific country. Uh, we also do market briefs, again, which is also a bit basic uh, about the country that you want to export in, uh, what are the requirements to enter that market, you know, even covering e even issues such as population, uh, currency use and stuff like that. Then we also do export development. Uh, which is the department that I'm, 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 I'm in. Um, and here we do more capacity building and technical intervention. We have various programs that are available um, to farmers and some can actually be tailor-made to, uh, to a specific number of, uh, of clients or a group of, um, of farmers. Uh, some of the, the, the projects um, include, um, so in, some, in terms of technical interventions, we have uh, partnership. I think the main partnership that I can share with you right now, even in light of uh, the COVID restrictions, is one that we have with PUM, which is an, uh, an organization from Netherlands that uh, has senior experts. So right now, um, they're actually doing what they're calling uh, remote coaching. Uh, basically, what they do is, um, under normal circumstances, before the COVID restrictions, what they would do is um, you, are, you send through your application. If it's accepted, they send through an expert. It can be on uh, technical issues, production. It can be on soil management. Uh, it can be on water issues, irrigation. Um, and then they are assigned to you for about two weeks. Um, and uh, while they're with you, they're basically at your disposal to ask them or for them to assist you on any aspect that they are knowledgeable on. And in terms of costs, I think which is the most important aspect is um, it's mostly, you, you could say it's mostly free of charge, especially if you're comparing to the uh, benefit that you receive, because what happens is, what would happen is PUM would cover uh, that expert's international travel costs, including flights. And all you'd have to do is take care of that expert while they are in Zimbabwe. And that is um, providing them with accommodation and food. And they won't even charge you any consultancy fees. Um, but also, even in terms of accommodation, they're not going to um, request five-star treatment where you put them up in the likes of the Mikkels and all that. Even if you have a farmhouse, as long as it's decent and habitable, uh, they're more than willing to actually even uh, stay on, uh, on the farm so that um, they can get to uh, whatever needs to be addressed. Um, then on export promotion, we do uh, in-market or we attend in-market exhibitions, trade fairs. Uh, right now, we also, um, we, we, we're doing this uh, virtually as usual, which is the order of the day. We're attending virtual trade fairs and just basically trying to understand what the market requires so, uh, and also trying to interact with some of the buyers. And then lastly, we do advocacy and lobbying um, where um, basically we, we seek to um, assist farmers in terms of whenever they are facing any challenges uh, of a regulatory uh, nature or with any authorities. Um, so now moving on into the main reason why we're here. Um, um, so 
how we look at uh, potential markets from a Zintrain point of view, obviously, I think you'd all understand that we uh, want to look at it from um, import point of view, which countries are importing the most of a certain product. Uh, this basically gives a, a rough indication of the potential uh, market and its size and um, uh, how much of that um, in terms of value. So globally in, um, in 2019, uh, sorry, uh, this is uh, this diagram is just basically showing you the trend of global imports of garlic uh, from 2011 to 2019. Now, as you can see, um, well, I think from 2011 to 2016, uh, somewhat you could say, well, to 2015, um, the, 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 the trend had been somewhat um, average and then it jumped in 2016 and then dropped, uh, dropped in 2017 and 2018. Uh, 18 and but now I'm sure this um, this graph doesn't show the figures of 2020 um, uh, because the, the the data is not there yet from our main source. But I'm sure we can all assume that, especially with the coming in of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the global demand of garlic has um, uh, one can uh, can be forgiven to uh, for assuming that that demand is uh, has since surged. And um, I think for the next, um, we, we could assume uh, that for the next couple of years, uh, that'll be the case, um, despite of there being a vaccine or not. Uh, so I think the globally, the market of, of, of um, garlic is, is actually growing. And uh, there's an opportunity for the next couple of years for some local farmers to try and tap into that, uh, into that growth. Um, now, in terms of um, uh, which countries, uh, some of the countries that are uh, the top, uh, top importers of this garlic, again, giving you an indication of uh, the potential markets. Uh, so in 2019, and this has been also the case for the past uh, 10 years, Indonesia has actually been the largest importer um, um, of garlic. Uh, like I said, over the past 10 years, they've been topping um, uh, the import share. In 2019, they imported 21% of the global share uh, of, of uh, garlic imports, followed by Brazil at 9%, then you have the USA, and then you have Malaysia, Russia, Bangladesh. Uh, and then from, from the European context, you also have the likes of uh, Germany, UK, uh, Italy, and France. Um, also uh, basically coming in, uh, this is the top, I, I put it at top 12, but um, uh, why I also wanted to include UAE, because uh, from, from a Zimtrade point of view, we've also been noticing that the UAE is growing in terms of interests of uh, agricultural and horticultural um, uh, imports and um, and 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 they're uh, mainly focusing on Africa and uh, Zimbabwe is actually one of the countries that is uh, receiving uh, I would say on average uh, some uh, interest from um, uh, 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 some of these uh, these players um, from from UAE in terms of uh, uh, horticulture and agricultural products. And then um, I also thought of uh, zoning into Africa because uh, I know some people, when you hear some of the countries or you look at some of the countries globally, uh, some of us might, might start getting a headache in terms of how we then access that market. Now, um, uh, as we all know, um, the 1st of January, 2021 marked the uh, official launch of um, trading under the African continental free trade area. And uh, basically that also unlocks um, a lot of potential for Zimbabwean farmers to uh, focus on Africa as, as, as a potential uh, export market. And um, so uh, the, Afri the AFCFTA will also lock, uh, unlock um, a lot of uh, markets for, 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 for Zimbabwean growers. So in terms of Africa, that has been the trend. Um, I could, you, you could also say that um, on average, it's been ranging between uh, 80,000 to um, about 95, 96,000 over the past five years. Sorry, sorry, this is million, sorry. Uh, 85 million to about um, 96 million on average, even though in 2019, the figure stood at 82 million. Um, in terms of imports, Africa's imports of garlic. And um, um, I also have another slide where uh, I'm also looking at, um, at, at, at uh, the top importers in Africa. And you'll find that uh, Morocco uh, also even uh, on, in the past five years has also been uh, averaging as the top uh, importer uh, of garlic. Um, and in 2019, their market share was at 15% of total African imports. And then you have Senegal, and then our neighbor, South Africa, 
uh, importing 7% of Africa's market share uh, of garlic. And then you also have DRC, uh, Sudan, Tunisia, uh, Egypt, Kenya, Cote d'Ivoire, Mauritius, and then uh, the other African countries are constituting about 34% of um, the African imports of, of garlic. Now, again, I, I also felt that uh, um, some of us might then, uh, yes, despite the coming in of the continental free trade area, um, some of us might think, ah, well, um, how am I going to get my product into the likes of Tunisia, uh, Morocco, Cote d'Ivoire, you know, um, or any other countries, or even some of the countries that are high up uh, on the continent. Um, so again, I then felt it necessary to zone in uh, on the SADC within the Southern African region. Um, these are our neighbors, these are our friends. And um, uh, I think even in terms of market access, some of us may actually have traveled to most of these countries. So in terms of market access, that might uh, prove a bit easier than uh, other countries within the, um, the whole continent. So from a SADC perspective, uh, you'll then notice now that the, 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 there are two major countries that dominate uh, imports of garlic uh, within uh, SADAC. You have South Africa um, and uh, uh, taking 29% of uh, SADAC's total import share. Uh, and then you have DRC uh, taking 27% of uh, the regional um, uh, import share. And then you have the likes of uh, Mauritius followed by Mozambique, Angola, Botswana, Namibia, Seychelles, uh, Tanzania, Zambia, and um, uh, Eswatini. So um, from a, a Zimbabwean point of view, um, actually, if you, well, this is based on official da uh, data. Uh, the case on the ground might be different, but um, it's interesting to note that uh, based on the officially reported data, uh, we're actually the, 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 the least importer of garlic. So um, I mean, that might not be true in real terms, but still the fact that um, we, are, we are way down there, I think is, uh, we can take that somewhat as a positive because then um, uh, what it means is we can now go out there and uh, tap into uh, some of these markets instead of trying to uh, produce and, 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 and focusing on our local market. It means that uh, somewhat, I could say, even if it means we're importing something from uh, be it South Africa or somewhere, um, it's, it's an insignificant portion based on uh, the country's demand. So uh, I, would, I would also say kudos to the local uh, growers because then it means uh, to a larger extent, you're managing to sub, um, supply significantly the demand of the local market. So now what's left for us is to um, now try and um, tap into uh, some of these export markets and uh, actually grow our local production. Now, obviously, I think um, we can't talk of exports without talking about um, uh, the market requirements. So what I did is I have a couple of requirements um, from a local point of view. Um, what do you need to comply with? Uh, um, who do you, what do you need uh, from a local point of view, local perspective, before you can even take your produce out of the country? And I also have um, uh, added uh, some of the requirements for some of these from some of the global markets, which you also then need to comply with. So, from a Zimbabwean context, uh, first and foremost, um, you need to uh, make sure that your shipment, whenever you want to export, it should be accompanied by a set of documentation which is complete. And it doesn't matter whether you're sending one kg, one ton, or thirty tons. Um, the documentation, the requirements for the documentation is the same. And uh, some of the documents include a CD1 form, which you can get from uh, if you engage your banker. I think I'll talk a little bit more on that. And then you have your agro dealer certificate. Uh, again, I'll talk a little bit on that phytosanitary certificate and the like. So, what is an agro dealer certificate? Uh, this is. Um, uh, a certificate which is obtained from the Agricultural Marketing Authority. Uh, basically, they regulate um, the uh, trading and producing um, of uh, agricultural commodities. So you need to register with AMA and um, their registration is an annual registration uh, as an agro producer or an agro dealer. And their offices are at uh, number eight, Le Mans Road. Uh, this is along Second Street um, near the UZ 10 off. And um, our, uh, just, uh, I would say conveniently so, uh, our offices are, uh, you could say literally across the road from, from where AMA is. 
and uh, we can share a bit of uh, more information on trade advice and tips and other market opportunities. But I'll, I'll, I'll let me hasten to say that at the moment, again, because of COVID-19, we are not accepting walk-in clients. Uh, so, but you can um, uh, book an appointment or uh, call through. I, I have our contact details and then either an officer can be assigned to you and assist you remotely um, and you can pick up the conversation from there. And like I said, the agro dealer certificate is, an, is a once-off annual certificate. You pay it uh, once a year and um, it's valid for the whole year and you have to renew it um, there after, again, after, every, uh, the, after the year is complete. Then you also need to get an export permit from the Ministry of Lands, Agriculture and Rural Resettlement. And uh, this one is issued for a specific quantity and time period. And uh, their offices are at number one, Borodeo Road, just after the State House. And um, like I said, it's for a specific product, maximum quantity and time period. So you need to, 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 to bear that in mind when you uh, submit your application. Then you also have, um, you need to have a phytosanitary certificate which is uh, obtained from um, uh, Plant Quarantine and Research, um, uh, Plant Quarantine Services Institute. Uh, so they have two offices uh, in Mazowe and um, Harare Airport. I'm not sure if they've added since after that. Um, but they basically, this certificate attests that your product meets the phytosanitary requirements as specified by the importing country. So basically, this is like a, a health certificate to certify that. Um, uh, issues such as your residue, uh, chemical residue levels, and uh, basically to, to, to confirm that uh, your product, if, if you use any chemicals, uh, is, is, is actually fit for human consumption. Um, so it's also important to note that in, um, the export permit is required from the ministry, is, is a requirement uh, by the plant health inspectors um, at the... Um, uh, 40% of that would have to be converted and then 60% is yours to use at your disposal for um, that. And now there's no limit. And then you need to process your bill of entry uh, with Simra. Uh, you can engage a clearing agent to assist. And uh, this bill of entry specifies the product, quantity, value, transport, and code of exit, which you're exporting through. When the auditors are coming through, they'll also need, they'll also even have a conversation with your labor to make sure that um, uh, you're not taking advantage of your employees, you're paying them on time. Uh, they are also getting uh, even it covers even issues such as rest, uh, uh, off days, and stuff like that. The, um, and then, so you need to to be aware of that. So, um, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, aspects of environmental protection, organic, and fair trade certification are also becoming more popular in in Europe. And it's important to note that as well. If you are to if you are to go the organic route and you do manage to get the organic certification, it also enhances your, um, your, 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 your market price. So you can get a premium price on your product as long as you have uh, uh, some of these certifications. So you can demand more uh, based on, um, on, on, on having such certifications from your buyers. And um, uh, it's also important to know that even though there are some uh, countries that are not in Europe, even um, some buyers in the likes of uh, UAE and some Asian countries, uh, 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 even though you, they, they don't have a requirement for the um, global gap, but it seems like it's, it's, it's almost like an, a, a way to go. Uh, or in, if it doesn't, again, it will still add your bargaining power when you want to bargain for a certain price for your produce. So it's, it's, I think it's worth considering. And then in terms of packaging, I think um, uh, this is basic. Uh, the requirements differ uh, between the customers and the markets that you're targeting. And um, uh, basically, they, they need to be packed in order to pr protect the produce and uh, make sure that it's clean and quality packaging also, which prevents uh, damage to the product. And um, also, it should protect the taste and flavor and color and uh, other characteristics of the product and um, also protected from issues of uh, bacteria and other contamination and not pass out any odor, taste, color and other foreign characteristics of the product. Now I added that um, link uh, at the bottom there. Uh, that's just a link on one. Um, please note, this is not a recommendation, uh, a, 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 a direct recommendation to farmers out there. 
I just thought that it would be interesting uh, if you want to look at some of the packaging. This is a Netherlands company. Um, if you want to target the, Euro to the European context, this might give you an indication of um, some of the packaging, uh, the types of packaging that are used um, uh, in Europe or particularly in the Netherlands, so that if you then want to target that as your, as your potential market, you also prepare accordingly. So as I say, this is not um, a prescription uh, for you to go with that particular pro, uh, packaging. As I mentioned, it, uh, the requirements differ between the customers that you're dealing with and the market se uh, segments. And as well, in terms of labeling, obviously you need to include uh, the name of the food. This, these are the basic labeling requirements, uh, net quantity, country of origin, uh, name under which the product is sold, minimum durability date, storage conditions, and um, in, again, in other markets, it's also now mandatory for labeling to include a uh, nutritional declaration. And um, I thought this important as well to add because uh, garlic, uh, you could export it as, as fresh uh, garlic or some of you may think of uh, adding value to it, maybe crushing the garlic or uh, preserving it in brine uh, or in oil or in, 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 in other different aspects. So you, when you then choose to, to uh, value add obviously other components such as um, amounts of fats, saturates, carbohydrates, sugars, proteins, and salt uh, within that um, uh, product of yours becomes important or requirement. And in, any, in the event that you also uh, use a factory, say for example, that uh, also does other products uh, which may have allergens, you might, uh, I think you also obviously need to highlight that. And um, also it's a, it's a requirement in terms of the actual labels that they must not contain any toxic ink or glue, again, for the sake of product safety. I think um, this year I was talking about uh, some of the requirements like global gap, fair trade, and, uh, uh, but I, I think for the sake of time, um, I will not labor much on, 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 on that. Um, so in terms of the way forward, um, I think one important aspect that we need to uh, be cognizant of is competitiveness um, and, and, and our pricing when we're looking at export. I think a lot of things um, uh, we've, we've, no, we've noticed that uh, with, a lot, with a lot of people in Zimbabwe, um, we tend to look at um, making profits uh, or uh, huge profits uh, for our products or produce. But when, when we're now dealing with uh, exports, the, 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 the game becomes a bit different. Um, you need to be competitive. And at times you even notice that um, some exporters actually export either at break even or in terms of their margin of profit becomes significantly lower even compared to their local markets. And as exporters or potential exporters, we need to be aware of that. If you can get away in the local market from uh, a, a 10, 20, 50, 100% um, uh, profit margin, that it doesn't necessarily mean that when you get into the export market, um, it's a highly competitive environment. So you may not even get away with a 5% margin on your product. So you need to be aware of that. But then what's important as well is I think um, as we all understand, especially in the Zimbabwean context, forex is also the, the issue of the forex becomes an, an, a significant or important aspect. The fact that you're going to be earning, earning forex, um, if you put 50% markup in the local market you're, and, and, and you're getting it in RTGS, I think we can all understand that when we get into exports, um, at times, if you put a 5% markup and you get your product, you get your produce, you get your money. Um, at times it becomes less of a hassle than trying to, to get a significant margin um, uh, profit, margin of profit from the local market. And then the issue of compliance, the regulatory requirements and voluntary standards is very important if you want to access some of these markets. So you need, as, as, as growers, you need to adhere to the quality and food safety standards. And um, um, you need also to develop strong value chains that are developed for uh, or geared for exports. At times, um, uh, as an individual, you can't do it alone. But if you can come together as a group, um, some of the requirements or the demands of the export markets in terms of capacities and quantities, um, uh, you'll find that uh, in most cases, uh, no single singular farmer can actually meet some of the demands uh, of, of certain buyers. So if you can come together, form a group, come together as a group, 
especially if you are within the same region and uh, improve your capacities, improve your quantities, then again, it gives you a better standpoint, uh, even from a bargaining point of view. And you also need to consider the issue of value addition, as I mentioned. Um, yes, you can find a market for um, raw garlic or fresh garlic, but at times you can enhance your value uh, by uh, adding a, proce a process of say, merely crushing the garlic and uh, adding it in brine, uh, uh, wine vinegar, uh, or whichever preservative you, you, you think of uh, using, or even um, uh, mixing it, let's say with um, uh, other products such as chilies or ginger and garlic, and the like, you can enhance your, 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 your value of your product uh, in the export market. And you also need to research and grow for the market. Don't grow first before you understand what market uh, you're growing for and what their requirements are and what their, what their potential uptake can be. We've seen a lot of farmers who after hearing um, or reading even through the press that there's probably a market for this in this country and all that, they go ahead and start planning for production of that uh, produce without understanding the market, without, um, if anything, even um, trying to engage some of the potential buyers. And uh, more often than not, you find that um, that's what causes a lot of glut in the market, in the local market, because some of the growers would have grown targeting a specific market, but they haven't and fully understood the market demands, the potential buyers, and um, um, actually if they can even tap into that market and they end up just dumping the, uh, the produce on the local market. So you need to research and grow for the market. And um, you need to promote the products in the region and beyond. Uh, improve the ease of doing export business. As I mentioned, advocacy and lobbying is one of our main services. Uh, if you're facing any challenges, if you face any challenges, maybe um, in, in, in your process of trying to get the right documentation to start exporting, uh, don't hesitate to come knocking on our doors and we'll find out uh, where the, the, the glitch is, what the problem is, and uh, try and, and, and improve the ease of doing export business and get your product out there. And then um, we also need to leverage on existing trade agreements. I did mention the AFCFTA, um, African Continental Free Trade Area. As Zimbabwe, we also have bilateral agreements with uh, Mozambique, Namibia, Botswana, and Malawi. So those also present opportunities or potential opportunities to, ex to, to, to export um, with preferential treatment and lower tariffs, tariffs and uh, duty rates. Uh, under those agreements. And we're also um, a signatory to SADC and uh, COMESA. Uh, and we also um, are a member of the, Internet, uh, of the Economic Partnership Agreement again with Europe. Uh, so again, all those uh, trade agreements uh, gave, give preferential treatment to uh, local businesses and local producers in terms of trade. And then you also need to make use of resources being offered by development corporation partners. I did mention PUM uh, from the Netherlands being one of them. Uh, like I said, they are offering remote coaching. We have other uh, partnerships with, um, like for example, another organization from Germany called SES. But unfortunately, they because of the pandemic, they're not even they're, they're not even uh, offering uh, even remote coaching. So let's take advantage even in the meantime. Uh, where we there's a lot of restrictions, but there's still opportunities to to gain a lot of uh, expertise from some of these uh, DCPs. So let's tap into them, and also let's consider market divers uh, diversification. Let's not focus on one market. Uh, if again, if we come together as a group and enhance our capacities, let's try and spread our wings and diversify. Uh, look at um, not just one market, two three markets to also. Um, uh, protect ourselves from protect from potential changes in 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 in, in a singular market. So, um, as I mentioned, in terms of our contact details, um, that's our uh, trade information portal. Uh, there's a lot of information there um, which can help you. Uh, there's uh, documents on guide to trade agreements, guide for new exporters. Uh, some market pointers, even not just on garlic, on other pro products as well that you might be considering and uh, information on how we can help and smart tools. Uh, there are also some tools that we use, like uh, some of the tools that we use to get the information that I just presented to you. We could also do a training for you so that instead of waiting for uh, such platforms, if you say, for example, want to understand the potential market of clean uh, fine beans, um, you could simply go onto some of those uh, websites and um, 
uh, basically look at, 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 at what other countries are importing, who are the potential competition and the like, and, and you are well informed before you start producing for, for such markets. And then in terms of our contact details, um, that's our, 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 our number. And uh, yes, at the, right now, we do have some personnel in the office who can actually pick up the call. Uh, and um, uh, our email is info at zimtrade.co.zw and uh, you can send through your email and I think I'll share my personal email in the chat box as well for those that might want more information and um, then you can also visit us on social media. Uh, our Twitter handle is at ZimTraderLets and then uh, we're also on Facebook, ZimTrade Zimbabwe. Uh, please go through, um, uh, go to some of these social media platforms, feel free to get in touch and uh, we're more than happy to assist and get you to start exporting. I think that marks the end of my presentation. Uh, Rollins, I'm sorry, I know you had said 15 minutes. I think I went well above that, but um, thank you very much. And thank you everyone for your attention. Well, great, uh, many thanks for the question. That was a great presentation. Uh, thanks again. And our next uh, presenter is Mr. N. Karimba. Just checking if uh, he's on the call now. Okay, so in that case, uh, we have uh, Mr. Makotore. He's with uh, the Agribusiness and Markets Division under the Minister of Agriculture. Mr. Makotore, you can go for it. Okay, so we'll go back to Mr. Karimba. Mr. Karimba says uh, he's ready. Mr. Karimba, you can go for it. So whilst I'm trying to share your presentation, maybe you can introduce yourself in the meantime. Yes, a very good morning to you all members. Yeah, I hope you are going to be with me. So I was facing some challenges on network connectivity. Mm, I'm a member of the Gallic Association of Zimbabwe, uh, an association formed with the aim of enhancing productivity or uh, having a standardized production in the production of garlic, ginger, and turmeric. You know, United we stand divided before. So we have come up with the idea of joining hands so that we are, so that we join together, we produce the best uh, quality needed uh, under a well standardized uh, program. We have members in uh, all around here, uh, around the Zimbabwe. That is Blawai in all provinces, but our offices are at uh, in Borodo number eight. Not in Borodo. Our offices are in. Uh, okay, I, I I will show you the the, the place for where we are located. First of all, I want to present you on the garlic costing returns posting returns per hectare of garlic. Those who are intending to be in for if to be mm, in for garlic. Uh, before I go any further, these crops are high paying crops. They demand more of capital. Uh, so I encourage people to start small and grow big as you gain experience. Because if you want to, to start big without much of experience or expertise, you will not produce an optimum yield. So I urge people to start small and we grow big. That's what we have learned from this. Uh, with the, that's our experience with these uh, crops. Right. Uh, my the budget stand like this, the costing is stand like this. We have direct expenses. Direct expenses include seed, biosol fertilizers, agricultural lime, calcium nitrate, 
and the, all other pest disease chemicals. As we have been told by the a member from ZFC, that there is need for fertilizers, there is need for pesticides and so forth. I think you have a, a part of the fertilizers needed, right? Then we also have variable costs, variable costs including labor, plowing, irrigation, water, insurance, etc. Uh, direct expenses. I think you know you know what they mean. That is those expenses that are needed uh, uh, for every without before starting anything. You have to have these things. Before starting production, production of garlic, you must have all these uh, uh, costs. You must incur all these costs, like land, uh, seed, fertilizers, and so forth. So in brief, I don't have much of time. So let me uh, make, just make a, a summarization of the budget. Direct expenses, mostly for a, hectare, for a one hectare unit, it's, it ranges uh, from 7,590 US dollar. That is in brief seed you need or 800 to 1,100 1, kgs at 6 US dollar per kg, which is, so if, we are, if you use, if you are using 1,100 kgs, we are at 6,600 US dollar for seed on, that is for a hectare. You see, as I said, that this uh, project needs a high capital to start it. Then for basal fertilizers, you need 21 by 50 kg bags. 21 by 50 kg, at an average of 30 to 30 US dollar per kg, which is 630. Agricultural lime, you need uh, about four by 50 kg bags, which is 12 bags. At twelve dollars, an average of twelve dollars, which is forty-eight. Costs are measured need about four by fifty kgs, which is fifty fifty-three dollars, which is two hundred and twelve. All other ex expenses like pesticides, disease chemicals, we need something like hundred hundred years to. So for total direct expenses to be seven thousand five hundred ninety. From direct expenses, we go to variable costs. Those are indirect expenses that you also need. Things like labor, plowing, irrigation, and so forth. Uh, normally, we make it a uh, half of the direct expenses. That is the on accounting economic point. We need half of the direct expenses, which is half of 7,590 which is 3,795. So our total expenses will be variable cost plus direct cost, which is 7,509 plus 3,795. That's our total cost, which is 11, around 11,385. Garlic yield, we now want to go to garlic yield, then from yield, that way we'll be determine our sales there. One garlic bulb can make 23 grams, up to 23 grams, if you have done it properly. So 40 garlic bulbs can make one kg. At a planting rate of 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters, I think you have heard it from our ZFC member. If, uh, explained the spacing, inner row spacing and inner row spacing. So I will jump from this one. So our one hectare unit of 10,000 square meters, we have um, about 1 million plants. And 1 million plants mod, uh, multiply by 40 bulbs or by one kg. We end up on 25,000 kgs the yield. That is maximum yield if you have done it properly. Minimum yield, we can say, you can put it at 10,000, 
10,000 cages per, per hectare. So assuming that uh, a minimum export price of three dollars, three US dollar per cage on the international market, because an average price of garlic on international price is around three US dollar. So three US dollar in Zimbabwe, I think for local market, it is above far above that. So the quantities uh, needed for the local market is a little bit uh, lesser than that of the export market. So we can say three US dollar times 25,000, that is maximum yield per, per hectare. We reached 75,000 per hectare. So return per hectare is total sales minus total expenses, which is 75,000 less 11,385. Meaning our return per hectare will be 63,615. A return of 63 can be achieved within four to six months. Four to six months, because we produce, yeah, we can say uh, that is four to nine months, because we also need time for curing the garlic. So that's part of uh, the budget. A budget for for garlic. However, for our local market, we have a limited number of uh, the quantities are very lim are very limited quantities consumed by the local market. That is the uh, way we our Mr. Kudakwashi was saying we have to plan for your if you want to venture into this project. Say. It, needs, it requires high capital. So you have to plan for your market first. As an association, as Garlic Ginger Association, uh, we are there to explore for, for the market in conjunction with the Zimtrade, in conjunction with AMA, we are guided on, on the search for the market. And the search, the market is there already. What is, what is only needed is our certification that we can certify the market in terms of quantities, in terms of quality. We are far much, we are far behind in terms of quality. We are far behind in terms of quantity. And all this can be achieved by joining hands together. And that is, that's why we are there as Garlic Ginger Association. So that by a certain period of time, say in a two year plan, three year plan, we, when informing this association, we're having a five-year plan. And the, now we are into uh, the second, we are going into the, three, into the third year. And we are seeing progress in, the, in as far as uh, our quality is concerned, in as far as our production, yeah, our quantities is concerned. What is now left is for us to suit that gap requirement. Uh, that is needed by uh, international markets. It requires a lot of uh, requirements, uh, whereby some of our members are not able, uh, they are not having the capacity to suit uh, those requirements. But as one member, or as one thing, as Garlic Ginger Association, we are, uh, I think by next year, we, everything will be okay for us. because. If one farmer suit uh, that requirement, it means other farmers will copy that. Other farmers will go through him. Those are advantages of joining the association. So as an association, we are calling so many farmers, so many potential, potential farmers to join the association so that we move together. Because it, it, shall, it shall come we shall come the time when uh, we shut the door. We say, ah, we, it's enough now. We can move together with our, with our target market. Uh, I think we are okay for us to, to move as a team. Because you cannot continue adding uh, people whereby uh, the market will not be enough for, for us. So at the moment, we are encouraging people to join the association.
there's an association. Another advantage of joining the association is uh, it is to consult financial institutions that will uh, help us as a group and like as an individual. Even to the government, the government will recognize a group of people and like a single person. So uh, some of our challenges we afforded to the government, the government is knowing it. Uh, that is how, uh, for example, the influx of imports from China, the government, it is under control now. We are seeing that in our local supermarkets, we are having our local product, our local garlic. We are also, the government also, AMA is also helping us on uh, pushing, delaying payments from, uh, from retail shops that you have the tendency of delaying payments the, uh, to the farmers. So this, this advantage comes out after joining the, 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 the association. Those are some of the um, advantages of uh, joining the association. I also want to, I also want to, to make a short brief on byproducts of this uh, of garlic. Yes, we have been yet from Mr. Gurakwashi, but we are the people on the ground as garlic as farmers or as a, as a, as a garlic association. We have so many byproducts of uh, garlic. On garlic, you won't uh, lose anything on garlic. Uh, for example, um, you can't say my garlic have been, is, is rotten, so I have to throw it, or I have to, just the same way, like tomatoes, cabbages, and so forth. In garlic, we can make, uh, we, can garlic, we can crush garlic into garlic powder. Uh, the garlic powder, that will be, Use the spices. In garlic, we can mm, make some, we can make a uh, garlic lotion. I think we have it, that is the pale mosquito and so forth. In garlic, you can you can make a uh, garlic garlic tea. In garlic, so many. Uh, byproducts from from garlic. So you, what is only needed in garlic production is your determination, patience, because it ranges from four to nine months for you to to enjoy the returns. But I think that's the same with other agricultural products. Even maize, you have to go to go a little bit further after harvesting. With the tobacco, you have to go a little bit further after everything. So you need to be to have patience that after harvesting, you put it in a shed, you cure it, right? Then you sell it later. So that's garlic as an association. We say it's a store of value. That's where value is stored. You produce, you store it somewhere. You move it uh, gradually. That's what I have. Uh, uh, that I, that, that I, that's what I have for you uh, for the part of uh, garlic, turmeric, ginger association of Zimbabwe. Thank you. Well, many thanks there, uh, Mr. Kwarimba, for the great presentation. Uh, it was really insightful. So we thank you all uh, for the questions that you have been posting for the Garlic Association in the chat. And if you have a burning question, please also post it in the chat section. So we'll now go straight into our question and answer session. And we have a number of questions here. And the first one is, how can we access the Garlic global markets from Zim? I think Kuda uh, touched on this one. I don't know if you want to add more uh, CUDA from Zimtrade. 
Uh, well, I would say not exactly. And um, but but then uh, I think uh, Mr. Is it Kwarimba from uh, Garlic and Ginger Association also touched a little bit on that in terms of um, uh, going through uh, the association as well um, to, to, to try and access some of these global markets. But um, uh, again, if, if you feel you need to, to need, if you feel you need more information, again, please feel free to visit either the association or ZimTrade and um, we'll be more than happy to share any information uh, on potential markets uh, that we have. Okay, uh, great. Thanks, Kuda. Then the next question here is how much does, does it cost to do soil analysis and how much soil is, request, is required, including from which parts of the field? So I'll take that one again. How much does it cost to do a soil analysis? Then two, how much soil is required for the analysis? And uh, three, the third part of the question is from which parts of the field do we collect the soil for analysis? Uh, that you can go for it. Okay, uh, thank you for that one. Uh, at ZRC, we've got uh, uh, different packages, four different packages. You can decide to, to, to analyze one element, uh, say nitrogen alone. Uh, you can also decide to, to analyze pH alone and also all other elements. So basically to analyze pH only, it will cost you three US dollars or local currency equivalent. Then to have a basic package, uh, which is quite comprehensive, which includes your pH, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium, uh, and your zinc, that will cost you 25 US dollars. So you take your soil sub samples from the field from which you want to grow your garlic, a field that is uniform. You come up together with a, a minimum of 10 sub samples. You thoroughly mix them together and from that thorough mixture, you extract just 500 grams to one kg uh, to one kg of, of soil. That will just be enough. Maybe you can simply, as a guide, maybe you can use a magica just to, to bring in uh, the soil sample. This will be enough for us to, to analyze yourselves. And uh, turn over time, pH is something within, we get your pH results within a week. Then uh, for your uh, full analysis, we get the results in two to two and a half weeks. Great, thank you there, uh, Zizai, for addressing that question. Then the next question we have is, will this webinar be upload, uploaded on YouTube for future reference? Yes, definitely, we'll share, we'll upload um, in the next few days on our YouTube channel. Then the, the fourth question, the fourth question says, can you go, can you grow garlic successfully in a hydroponics or aquaponics environment? I don't know who can take that one. Maybe the association. Mm, at the moment, you haven't done much of uh, this uh, research, but you are engaging uh, Zimbabwe Defense University and uh, Midlands University for that. And I think in the few years, we'll be able to, to know which is right. Ah, okay, great, thank you. So there's need for, 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 for more research um, uh, on, on, on that regard. Then the following question says, how do we know the webinar was uploaded? Okay, so uh, you can, share your email addresses in the chat section then we'll let you know once we have uploaded also you can subscribe to you can subscribe to the youtube channel so that whenever you we upload content there you'll be notified the next question is where can i get organic certification that one is uh, is uh, maybe zim trade you can go for that one Sorry, uh, where can you get organic certification? Is that correct? Yes, certification. Yes. Okay, so um, there, there, there are different organizations. Um, you could approach Zim Organics. Uh, that's one. But uh, as well, um, from an from 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 an international point of view, 
you can uh, ap approach even the likes of um, uh, Fair Trade. And um, I, I just need to check the other organizations in South Africa. Uh, maybe you can move on to the next question and then I'll, I'll come back on that. But I think locally you can, you can um, uh, engage Zim Organics. Uh, okay, great, thank you. Then the following question says, how small is small if you want to start? Uh, that's for the association, I think. Okay, so they're saying uh, the representative of the association said you can start small. So I think the question now is how small uh, is small if you want to start. You start off with a acre, but I think maybe it depends on the available resources, but uh, I think maybe the association can elaborate more on that one. Uh, I can I can I can say it in the uh, in terms of seed. You can start with the five kgs. The ratio is yes, yes you see it's one s to ten up to fifty. So if you uh, if if you start with five kgs and uh, multiply it to by ten, you have fifty kg in the first year. In the second year, from fifty kgs, you go to five hundred kgs. So in the third, the third year, we will be in, in, into a into a hectare. We will be already starting to to produce a hectare. On the other hand, you will have much expertise and experience in 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 the production of this uh, of garlic. That's what I can say about that uh, in terms of uh, how small is small. Ah, great. Uh, thank you for addressing that question. Then the following question says, please send me details of the Garlic and Ginger Association. I would like to join. Can you share maybe the details for the association? Yes, I can. I will I, I share. All right. No, that's fine. Then the Following question, they're asking for Mr. Mitzi's contact. Okay, Kupa question with his contact. I'm sure he had shared before. Maybe uh, Mr. Mitzi, if you can share in the chat as well. Yes, so he's posted uh, his email is kmitzi at zimtrade.co.zw. Then for ZFC, it's um, Zizai. It's, Phone number is 0774 001323 monotod at zfc.co.zw. Then another question is who are the suppliers of garlic seed? The association, maybe you can take that one. Yes, it's the association. Association is the one who will refer you to the uh, Institution that will that will supply best seed and best varieties. Okay, so that's fine. So if you want, uh, uh, if you are looking for garlic seed, the association is your uh, source. Then, how much garlic is consumed in Zimbabwe for the local market? Do we have the statistics uh, from the association? Yes, we have, but not prepared it now. Was uh, I was only there to represent to to present the budget and the other benefits of the association. I think uh, we can hear from Ama. Okay, no, that's fine. We'll try and get more information on that. But do you do you know are we importing any garlic at the moment? Importing or exporting? No, importing. Yes, there are some where there is a gap whereby we'll be not having any garlic in the market. Ah, we import. Okay. That is around. Okay. Uh, uh, that is around May, July, August, before we harvest. Or only those two months, two three months. 
Ah, okay. So that's an indication. So maybe it also partly answers um, the the question from from a farmer here that um, if we are importing, so it means there is uh, an existing demand for for garlic. That's in terms of the local market. So I think these are the questions that we had. If there is no other question, I think this marks the end of our webinar. We would like Sorry, to thank Rollins. Ye yes, Cooper, question. Okay, so in terms of uh, the associations that do organic certification, so locally we have uh, an organization called ZOPA, that's uh, Z-O-P-P-A, um, and uh, they are the ones that uh, focus on on organic certification locally. And then the person can also try and uh, check for Ecoset. Ecoset, that's E-C-O, then C-E-R-T. Uh, that's an international organization that also does uh, organic certification. Uh, okay, uh, that's, that's great. Uh, thanks for, for sharing the, the contacts. So maybe you can Google more, yeah, farmers, you can Google more and get more information on the uh, uh, locally available uh, organizations that do certification. Then if you want to join our WhatsApp groups, these are free groups where we have informative discussions on the business of farming. You can click on the link that we have just shared in the chat then you uh, get instructions, just follow the instructions there on how you can join and benefit from the discussions. So I think this now marks the end of our presentation, or our webinar rather. And thank you very much for being part uh, of this webinar. It was a success and thanks to our presenters from ZFC, uh, from Zim Trade, Kupakwashe Mizi, and also from uh, the Garlic Association. We thank you for being part of this webinar. So we thank you all and have a great day. We'll keep you informed on our upcoming events and webinars. Thank you very much, uh, our presenters, and thank you very much, farmers, for for joining in. We appreciate it. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.